Hi, so I'm currently doing a postdoc here at Memorial with Duncan McElroy, but what I'd like to talk to you um, about today is some of the work that I did during my PhD at Cambridge with Nick Butterfield and with Phil Wilby at BGS. Um, so, yeah, as Mark said, uh, I will be talking to you again about randomorphs. I'm sure you're a little bit sick of them at the moment. But broadly, we can group them into different broad morphotypes. So we have bushy ones like Braggatia, ones with stalks like these dumbbells and prima candelabrums, uh, the more frondose ones like Charnia, which we've just heard Frankie tell us about, and flat-lying fractifusis and pectenophrons fits in with that. And randomorphs are commonly found with arboreomorphs, so um, Charnia discus primarily. So my main field areas were Avalonia, so the sites that now comprise uh, Charnwood Forest in the UK and southeast Newfoundland. So most of you hopefully have been lucky enough to go down and see Mistaken Point, or if not, are going to see Bonavista. And during the Ediacaran, Avalonia was part of a, a volcanic island arc situated about 60 degrees south, so nice and warm and sunny. And the sediments that we have, at least where the Rangimorphs are found, are deep sea sediments, so predominantly turbiditic, with a volcanoclastic input and some small tophaceous units. And it's typically under these tufts that we get the Rangimorphs preserved. And what uh, we began to notice is that there's, and anyone who's seen these sites, is that there's a lot of differences in the community composition between the various sites. Um, you get different taxa uh, appearing in the different communities. Uh, there's a little bit of difference in the morphology in different sites of what appear to be the same taxa. And in modern ecologies, in modern uh, ecosystems, particularly for sessile communities, and as we've heard, the Rangimorphs, we don't have ev any evidence that they moved, um, disturbance is a really important factor. If you can't run away from something, then disturbance is something that you have to deal with or avoid. And you can broadly group disturbance into two types. So there's the ambient disturbance, so the everyday, um, the everyday disturbance, so the amount of hemipelagic sediment coming in, um, on terrestrial systems, it would be the amount of wind, small fires. And then there's discrete or major disturbance events. So these would be big storms, um, major sediment deposition, large forest fires, and of course in modern reef systems, it's things like um, dredging and uh, a lot of anthropogenic disturbance. And if you've been down to Mistaken Point, you will have of course seen the, the Tuckermore forest. So these trees that are really stunted and really small. And as soon as you get to the, the the valleys where it's more sheltered, there's less wind, the same trees grow lo much larger. So as well as having different species present, we can also think about differences in the morphology, differences in their ecophenotype um, as a result of the environmental conditions that they're living in. And this idea of ecophenotypism in Rangimorphs is something that we're really only just starting to look at. And a really classic example of modern disturbance is Table Mountain um, in Cape Town. And so on the, the west side of the mountain, there's very little wind, you get big trees. On the summits, there's, very, there's a lot of wind, so you get um, reeds, so that's kind of comparable to Mistaken Point, although a little bit more tropical. Um, and on the eastern side, you get varying amounts of forest fires. So where you have frequent forest fires, you get communities that are dominated by annual plants. And where there are very sporadic forest fires, you get much more mature communities, larger, larger trees. And what this gives you a sense of is this idea that there are um, different life history traits to, different, random, or to uh, different organisms, depending on whether they're adapted to low disturbance or high disturbance environments. Typically, if you have very little disturbance, then competition becomes a much more important factor. So where competition is important, uh, beneficial life history traits, things like fast growth, early maturation, rapid production of large amounts of offspring, and conversely, when there's high disturbance, you tend to grow slower, you reach maturity later, and you disperse your propagules wide to try and find a, an ideal site to grow. And a really classic idea in ecology is this intermediate disturbance hypothesis, so this kind of Goldilocks zone for diversity where you get some low disturbance taxa, some high disturbance taxa. And so we thought we'd try and see if we could test this in Rangimorph communities. And to do this, we chose only the very large um, laterally extensive surfaces where preservation is very good, so where you can see second order branching characters so you can get a, a really good handle on the, the taxonomy. 
and where preservational factors that um, Jack Matthews has been looking into aren't so much of a problem. And of course, the, the, the type for the laterally extensive community is, of course, mistaken point E. To look at disturbance in um, marine ecosystems, bioturbation, of course, is very important in modern systems, but we didn't have to worry about that in the Ediacaran. Things we do have to worry about are sediment input and geochemical changes and changes in oxygen. And realistically, we're never going to be able to test those on an ecological time frame. But we can look at a proxy for the amount of sediment coming in by looking at the hemipelagite under, immediately underneath the fossil surface, um, the surface that the fossils are preserved on. So where the, the fabrics are consistent in the hemipelagite, you can use that as a proxy for the environmental conditions that the Rangier moss would have been living in. And we can categorize this on the amount of coarse sediment, its grain size, whether it's delivered laterally or settling through the water column, and various other parameters. We can also describe the communities themselves using, a very, using various numbers of metrics. So the amount of total taxa, the proportion of the, these different flatlying or bushy or stalked or upright taxa, uh, the prevalence of different <coughs> branching characters, so whether you're displayed and open like a Bragatia, or whether you're more tucked in like Chania, and also the abundance of particular taxa. Um, I then put this through a couple of different multivariate statistical analyses and clustering algorithms, and that groups the bedding surfaces by the, um, by the different uh, community metrics. And when we do that, we find that generally, uh, the more diverse surfaces are associated with low to intermediate disturbance, uh, so sedimentological disturbance. Fractifusis and other flatlying taxa don't like a lot of sediment input. Upright and fell taxa are much more commonly found where you have more and coarser sediment coming in. And the other way that we can get a look at this is to have a look at the, um, the population structures of the different taxa. And we can compare these then to the population structures that you see in modern sessile organisms. So where you get, for example, discrete populations like this, so you've got three or maybe four discrete populations, that would represent something like pulsed reproduction, so either uh, release of propagules in a seasonal or sporadic manner, or maybe sporadic recruitment to the sediment, or you can get these more blurred uh, population structures, and they, could, um, they can form in a number of different ways, which if anybody is interested, I can talk to you about. Um, we can also get a combination of the two. So here you've got a discrete peak over here and these two more kind of blurred peaks here. We can also, to kind of test the trends that we see on different surfaces, we can look at the same taxon on different surfaces and see if we get the same sort of trait, which at least for fractifusers we do. And we can also look at a different taxa on the same bedding plane to see if there are um, particular events that are affecting them, so see if there's a shared history. So we, if we look at the fractifusis, so here, for example, we can see this, again, this discrete peak and these more smooth things, and that might represent a, either a break in, um, break in recruitment or reproduction, or also something like a, a positive feedback, where if you're large, it's easier to get food, so you grow larger. And perhaps these smaller ones, if they're in the clusters of clusters, like Emily has shown in her work on fractifusis, perhaps the smaller ones are feeling more intense competition than the larger ones. And that, again, is something that Emily's spatial analysis would help to pick out. And these tacks were from Charnwood Forest. And you can see at around the 20, 25 centimetre range, uh, there's a, a break. So you get a couple of really large individuals and then a bunch of normally distributed, much smaller ones. And there's a few things that can cause this. So we thought we'd slice a bit of the rock. So we had a sample from bed B. And what we can see really nicely is that there's a very, very thin tuff immediately underneath the mat on which the fossils are growing. So the fossils are on this surface here. And on the largest disks, we actually find little patches of this ash on top of the disks. But we don't find that on any of the smaller disks. So excuse me a moment. And so we came up with a model to explain this. So you have an initial cohort, which was normally distributed, so an initial um, community that was recruited to the surface or settled on it. Then you had a discrete disturbance event, in this case, an influx of ash. That killed most, but not all, of the individuals on the surface, and a couple of them survived. They grew large, either because competition was reduced or just because they had enough time to grow large. 
And then after a period of time undetermined, you have a new cohort recruited to the surface. And these were likely sourced from the survivors of the original disturbance event. They represent a local ready supply of propagules. When the whole community is culled with a, an event that none of the organisms, as far as we could tell, survived, you preserve the community with this, sorry, you preserve the bimodal, you preserve the population with this bimodal structure. And the fact that we can see this in three taxa, where the, the largest individuals are all of a similar size, gives us kind of a, a, a greater confidence that this is a, a real thing. So piecing this all together, we can get an idea of life history strategies for different randiomorphs. Generally, the flatter lying, bushier ones with displayed morphology um, seem to be better adapted to competition, or at least they didn't like disturbance very much. And for Fractifusis, where it had uh, the stolon-like reproduction that Emily demonstrated, that's really, really good for rapidly colonizing a surface area. It means you're really, really effective at taking up a load of space and therefore stopping other things, other organisms settling onto it. In contrast, the upright and stalked forms, particularly the furled ones, seem to be much better adapted to disturbance. We find those on the surfaces where the hemiplegia underneath has a lot more coarse sediment. And charnia particularly is associated with the coarsest input, which is really interesting, seeing as A, it's the most com cosmopolitan taxa, and also we find it in um, the much coarser sediments compared to the Avalonia sections in the White Sea and in Australia. So charnia, it seems, was really good at withstanding sediment. And we also have really good evidence that these upright and stalked ones <coughs> were able to survive disturbance events. So if we piece this all in together, we can get an idea of how an initial community might have, have evolved through time, so how succession might have worked in an Ediacaran community. So you have your starting population here, where there's very low disturbance, Fractifusis does its thing, colonizes the surface to the exclusion of most other taxa, and an example of that would be the H14 surface in Bonavista. Well, there's a little more disturbance, Fractifusis isn't quite so happy, so you can have um, a more diverse community. Some of the upright fronds can get a foothold. Where there's more disturbance, again, you exclude Fractifusis, you have more of the upright fronds. And in the highest ambient disturbance, so where you're getting lots more lateral input of coarser silt, you really just have Charnia. If you then impose a disturbance event on this, so that's these pink and orange arrows, you then cull part of the community and you're the secondary community, so the community um, that develops on the surface after the event, is likely to more closely represent the survivors of the event. And one thing that we would really like to test is the section of some more beds where we see these abnormally large fronds and to see if we can see similar evidence of a disturbance event. If we don't see a disturbance event, then it's possible that there was some uh, a, a chemical disturbance which we can't test for but we know there was a disturbance, so that's not unreasonable. Um, so a few people to acknowledge, particularly um, Supervisor Nick, Alex Liu for organizing the conference and doing a great job at it, and also for um, helping with everything through my PhD and postdoc, uh, various funding bodies, and to you for listening. Thank you. <laughs>